Welcome, everybody. I am Dr. John Strax, and I'm here with my friend and colleague, Dr. David Clark. For those of you who don't know us, I'll uh, introduce us. I am a family and integrative medicine physician in Chicago who runs the only mind-body medicine program in this area. I trained in general medicine and integrative medicine, uh, moved back to Chicago in 2009, partly to open a mind-body medicine program at Northwestern Hospital in downtown Chicago. I stayed there for seven years and then opened my own practice in 2017 as a way to get this type of medicine out to as many people as I possibly could. And so I currently, uh, during coronavirus, I'm running a virtual clinic. I see people for consultations for mind-body medicine. I have some groups and classes and discussion groups that I run. I run the Hope for Healing series for Curable, um, inviting guests like Dr. Clark on to talk about mind-body medicine and do ongoing consultations with my patients who are looking for this type of care. And so tonight's discussion is part of an ongoing series that we've been doing both for my own practice and for the Curable app that many of you know about. And Dr. Clark and I will be talking for a little bit about mind-body medicine and what we've learned about it and how we've practiced it over time. And then we'll spend the second half of the time taking questions uh, from you who are viewing us at the moment. And so this is a new format, the Zoom webinar format that we're trying out for the first time tonight. It's fairly user friendly. And so at the bottom of your screen, you should see a Q&A button. And if you have a question for us at any time this evening, go ahead and click on that button and type in your question and hit send. It will show up here in my studio in Chicago and we'll be able to answer that during the Q&A period at the end of the webinar. If you're on the phone, unfortunately, you don't have access to that Q&A button, but if you want, you can send a message to my office in Chicago to lisa at drstrax.com, lisa at d-r-s-t-r-a-c-k-s dot com. It will get to her, she will get it to me, and so our goal is to answer as many questions as we can before the end of the evening, which will be roughly around 6.45. Chicago time. So with that, let me introduce Dr. David Clark, who is the president of the Psychophysiological Disorders Association and an assistant professor of gastroenterology emeritus at Oregon Health Sciences University in Portland, Oregon. He's board certified in gastroenterology and internal medicine and practiced gastroenterology in Portland for 25 years before retiring in 2009. And during that time, he interviewed over 7,000 people about symptoms not, that were not explained by conventional medicine and diagnostic testing. He's received numerous awards for the, over the years for patient care, including from Kaiser Permanente, Pacific University and Portland Monthly Magazine. He's a member of the American Academy of Psychosomatic Medicine, the Psychosomatic Society, and the Collaborative for Family Healthcare Association, where he co-chairs the special interest group on medically unexplained symptoms. He's lectured extensively about psychophysiological disorders to internal medicine groups, family medicine groups, gynecology physicians, mental health professionals, physicians assistants, nurse practitioners, and other groups of practitioners, including chaplains, pharmacists, and chronic pain specialists. He's done over 20 television interviews and 100 radio broadcasts, uh, including those by Rosie O'Donnell, Montel Williams, and Michael Roizen. He also wrote the book that many of you have read called They Can't Find Anything Wrong about medically unexplained system, symptoms in gastroenterology and currently donates all the royalty for his book sales to the Psychophysiological Disorders Association. 
He's been a close friend and colleague and mentor for over a decade now, and I'm thrilled to have him here talking about this topic of mind-body medicine with me this evening. So, Dave, thanks for being here. Did I leave anything out in your- well, you, you left out the book that we both contributed to, which is a yes. new textbook called Psychophysiologic Disorders, and I was very honored to have you as one of our uh, chapter authors uh, in that book. It's, as you know, written mostly for professionals, but we uh, worked very hard to keep the jargon out of it so that the mental health professionals could read the medical chapters and vice versa. And one of the happy results of that is that uh, most people uh, who are not professionals in healthcare can also get a lot out of it. If yeah. the title is uh, just simply Psychophysiologic Disorders. Yeah, that came out last year um, and, and has done well. It's been well regarded and uh, has been brought by, as you said, both medical professionals and people not in the medical field. Yeah, you know, it's, it's done really well and it's gotten great reviews uh, on Amazon. So we're very pleased to have that out there because it, it's got 16 contributors from 16 different specialties from five or six different countries around the world. Uh, and it's just been wonderful to have uh, such diversity of perspectives uh, all come together in, into one volume. Yeah, it was fun to work on. So anyway, I want to talk with you about mind-body medicine before we get to people's questions. And I know that people will have many for, for both of us. Uh, one very important question that I promised my son I would ask before we get started. So he is a misplaced Portland Trailblazers fan in Chicago, Illinois. Yay. And was dying to know if you've actually been in the Moda Center. And if so, what's it like to watch a game there? Well, you know... The, the main thing you need in the Moda Center is earplugs because okay. it is unbelievable. I mean, the, uh, it's really the, um, along with our soccer team, the only professional sport we have uh, in Portland. So mm -hmm. they've got a tremendous fan base. Uh, they set the record for the most consecutive number of sellouts. And, you know, whether the team is doing well or not doing well, the, the city supports them uh, just uh, tremendously. Uh, you know, I'm sure just like Chicago did when the Bulls were, uh, winning all those championships uh, 20 years ago. Uh, so it's, it's a tremendous environment uh, for basketball. Very um, uh, great fan support. All right. Well, good. Well, it is a post-quarantine goal of his to get out to Portland, Oregon and Super. say hello and come to a game. So you've been involved in the mind-body medicine world for a long time. Can you talk a little bit about how you came into that form of practice earlier in your career? Yeah, you know, it's almost embarrassing as a physician to admit that I went through seven and a half years of education and training without having a clue that uh, mind-body issues could cause physical symptoms. Um, but inevitably, I ran into a patient who had those problems and very severely and was referred to where I was in uh, training at UCLA from another university where they had uh, utterly failed to help her or even to figure out what was wrong. Uh, we failed as well, um, and, but just sort of by accident, I asked her about stress in her life and, and alluded to the possibility that maybe stress from the past could be a factor because I was you know, completely out of ideas. Uh, there was no biomedical explanation for her very severe condition. And she shocked me by beginning to tell me about the fact that she'd been abused as a child uh, fairly severely, uh, was telling me about this in a very calm voice, uh, you know, the same tone that you might use to read a grocery list. There was no emotion about this from her. I was, you know, initially concerned I might, you know, stir things up or make her worse somehow, but she seemed to have everything under control. And not to uh, be bothered anymore by these uh, events that had taken place uh, 25 and more years in the past. But it was a very shocking uh, story to hear. And I didn't think it could possibly be relevant to her illness, but I thought, you know, what have we got to lose? And so I called a psychiatrist that I knew was interested in mind-body issues uh, and said, you know, got them together uh, for an appointment. And uh, forgot all about it until a, a couple months later, I ran into the psychiatrist in an elevator and just to make conversation, asked what had happened to the patient and was shocked again to learn that the patient was now completely cured with 
less than three months of uh, weekly counseling sessions. And there was nothing in my education. And for most medical students to this day, there is nothing in their medical education that even hints that such an outcome would be possible. Um, so I was, I was just kind of amazed. I, ran, I got myself hooked up with this psychiatrist whose name was Harriet Kaplan uh, and prevailed upon her to uh, sit in with us in uh, outpatient gastroenterology clinic. And we always came up with at least two or three patients that she was able to provide useful perspective and advice about. And that was how I got started learning that uh, you actually could get um, good outcomes if you knew what to look for. And, uh, you know, the result of that uh, 35 years later is, is the textbook uh, that it's crystallized a lot of the wisdom from other people around the world who followed a journey uh, similar to myself. Um, at the time I was learning this, there wasn't any textbook, there wasn't any fellowship you could take, there, there was no place you could go for training. When I came to Portland, Oregon to begin practice, there was no Harriet Kaplan here. Um, and a lot of the patients that went to mental health professionals got no benefit from that because few mental health professionals gain experience um, with people who are physically ill as opposed to having a mental or emotional problems. So I learned by doing, I learned through trial and error. I learned by by listening, uh, you know, I, I sometimes tell people I had 7,000 teachers. Um, and gradually over it, probably three, four, five years, uh, uh, things began to come together and, and make some sense. And I was, I was getting good outcomes. So I just kept on going with it. It was very rewarding work, as I know you found yourself. Absolutely. It's, and, you know, my pathway is a little bit different than yours because I went to medical school with this knowledge of the mind-body connection. I oh. had had my own pain issues before, in the process, actually, of applying to school. I was 28 years old. I read a book by, um, by our colleague, Dr. John Sarno, who uh, had done a lot of this work in the 1980s and 1990s and sorted out like what was going on with me. And after about a year, my symptoms went away. And so I got to school with this knowledge. I thought, oh, I'll just tell everybody what they need to know. And you were what, way ahead of everybody know, else, including me. But I had that little short white coat on, so nobody would listen to me for a long time. But then gradually, as I went through my journey in training, people, I, I learned to talk in a way that made sense to people. And so gradually was able to help more people make this connection between stress and non-physical factors that related to their physical symptoms and, and people started to get better. In the gastroenterology world, right, at this point in 2020, makes perfect sense to us that stress and other non-physical factors would come out in people's stomachs. Did you learn that early on in your training? Like, was there discussion about the fact that GI specifically was going to see a lot of people who had non-physical causes of symptoms? Or is that also something that you learned as you went on this incredible gut-brain connection? Well, there was certainly discussion that you know, one third of the patients you were going to see had one or more variations of irritable bowel syndrome. But the teaching was that, you know, there wasn't any known explanation for irritable bowel syndrome or IBS, um, that there wasn't really much you could do about it. You know, you might tell people to see if they could uh, reduce their stress level some. There were various medications, but those only treated the symptoms. And it was generally thought of as a therapeutic dead end. Uh, and what I learned from uh, Dr. Kaplan was that there was a, a whole world of psychosocial stresses uh, lying underneath most patients with irritable bowel syndrome. And if you could uncover what was going on with those, bring them to the surface, bring them to conscious recognition, then you could almost always do something therapeutically beneficial for the patient that would in turn lead to relief of the symptoms. And you know, I struggled um, for a number of years uh, early on trying to find out what those psychosocial issues were, trying to get, because the patients themselves often were not consciously aware of what was going on, and they, so they couldn't put it into words. You had to uh, know the right questions to ask, you, know, had to, how to, you had to know how to take 
little jigsaw puzzle pieces that people would sometimes uh, give you and put them together into a complete picture that you could then try to show the patient um, uh, in, in you know, a way that they weren't seeing for themselves. And when you did that, though, very often the uh, patient was on a pathway to healing, and sometimes the pathway would take years. Sometimes they needed psychotherapy for a prolonged period of time. But in other cases, patients improved uh, dramatically, uh, sometimes for the first time uh, uh, in a very long time. In one of my patients, 55 years of unexplained stomach pains. I saw him back in the days of paper charts and, you know, volume three was eight centimeters thick. Uh, and, you know, he was better, you know, he got complete relief in uh, less than three months. I mean, it was extraordinary. Yeah, it's, it's amazing. We see so many people who have all kinds of symptoms, migraine headaches, back pain, neck pain, foot pain, fibromyalgia. What do you have your own sense having practiced gastroenterology for 25 years about why so many of these symptoms come out in the GI system, stomach issues, IBS, any other GI disorder that we frequently see? Well, the GI tract has got lots and lots of nerves in it that are connected uh, to the brain. In fact, uh, it has been called uh, a second brain. It's got so many nerves in it. Um, the um, origin of that is very likely in the fact that when you are threatened by something, let's you know go back in evolution to the time when we were all living in the jungle or the forest and something threatened us, you don't want to have your circulation going to your GI tract. You don't want to have to stop and have a bowel movement when you're being chased by a tiger. Uh, so you need to have a way for the, your, your brain body system to, to shut the gut down so that the circulation and all the energy can go to your muscles uh, where they're needed. So that system uh, is is in all of us and it serves a good purpose. But when we are threatened by something uh, emotional or traumatic or stressful, um, the same system is called into play. And uh, when it gets um, uh, too active, it can actually produce symptoms. Uh, there's, there's a lot more going on than that. I mean, it, a lot of it has to do with um, if your emotions are suppressed because you're growing up in a challenging environment as a child, then when those emotions uh, are triggered as an adult, you don't have a sense for, you know, what an emotion is. So you get a sensation in, um, in your GI tract, for example, and you don't know that it's an emotion that you're feeling down there. So you start to think, oh, there's something wrong. You start to get afraid. Um, that triggers a cycle where you get even more worried that something's wrong, which can trigger even more sensations in your GI tract that you can't interpret as an emotion because you didn't learn that as a kid. And so it, the cycle just uh, uh, continues until you've got a uh, pretty significant symptom going on. So the main issue is the brain and the gut talk to each other all the time. And then you jump into the medical system that also oftentimes doesn't recognize what's going on. And so now only are, not only are you not aware that that's an emotion, but nobody else is too. And then so you start getting all these messages that, oh, well, it could be something serious and we need to get these blood tests and we need to do a scope and look in your stomach and then we're not sure what's wrong. And so then people will hear physicians say, well, maybe it's your head as if like that's a bad thing and it's, we're going to dismiss you because of it. And so my experience with people is that the medical system kind of recreates some of this trauma for them, not only in sort of not providing correct answers, but also oftentimes ramping up the fear and the worry that then makes it worse. That's right. I mean, if so many people have their symptoms exacerbated simply by the fact that no one can tell them what's causing their uh, their physical symptoms and they just you know you can imagine how that would make anybody worry about what's going on that you know even expert doctors from a variety of specialties with every sophisticated diagnostic test that we have in the 21st century uh, can't tell them what's wrong 
Um, you know, it's, it's just, um, I don't know if the word criminal applies here, but it's, it's a terrible thing that so many healthcare professionals have no idea that mind-body issues are even possible, um, let alone that they can be diagnosed and successfully treated. Yeah. And then you retired actually shortly after I met you. I think you and I met in 2008 or 2009 and you retired from your GI position at OHSU shortly after that. Can you tell everybody what you've been working on since then as a way to expand both practitioner and patient access to mind-body medicine? Yeah, you bet. I didn't actually, don't think of it as retirement. I think of it more as I, I closed my, uh, my practice because I, I felt like I had done as much as I could with one-on-one -on -one, uh, medicine. And I really wanted to spend my time teaching as much as possible. And I was very grateful to you and Howard Schubiner who put on a conference in Ann Arbor, Michigan, that was a starting point for many of us in this field that we met each other for the first time. So many of us had been working in isolation uh, with really no colleagues to share ideas with um, prior to that point. I hadn't even heard of Dr. Sarno until uh, about a year before that conference took place. Uh, so that, that tells you how isolated I was. Um, but once I found this, this group and we had this conference and we started talking about creating a nonprofit corporation that would work to uh, share these ideas amongst uh, healthcare professionals and the public. And <clears throat> we did that over the next um, couple of years. Uh, we founded it in uh, March of 2011, and we've been going uh, ever since. Uh, we have an executive director based in New York City. Uh, we've got uh, a Facebook page. We've got a uh, ppdassociation.org uh, is our website. And um, we've created a uh, webinar-based uh, training course for healthcare professionals that, the, again, we kept the jargon out so the public can also use it. Um, we created the textbook uh, with your support and that of uh, many others. And um, we, we are teaching healthcare professionals uh, at conferences and individually uh, all over the country and to a limited extent in Europe as well. Yeah, it's, it's amazing. It's amazing to think where we were in 2009 with, I think there were maybe 30 of us that showed up in Ann Arbor, which was a lot at the time, but to think of how it's grown, we've got an email list between the physicians who do this work and the psychotherapists that I think is well over several hundred at this point. And the momentum continues to grow. Obviously, Curable is an amazing addition to this work and a way to get out this information to, I don't know, I think it's feel like it's over half a million people who have downloaded the app at this point. But where do you see the continued work going? What are some of your goals for what we're doing over the next several years, say? Well, um, you know, ideally, uh, the kind of care that you and I provide would be as routine as anything else. Um, so that when people have a symptom and they, whether they use Dr. Google to find out about it or they use their own personal physician, that there's a general awareness that uh, mind-body issues should be considered and can be evaluated in parallel with everything else. I mean, you know, if you have an abdominal pain, uh, for example, uh, yes, we wanna make sure you don't have a gallstone or an ulcer, but right along at the same time that we're doing that, we should find out uh, about the stresses in your life. Um, those, those can be done uh, in parallel with each other. They're not mutually exclusive and it, it should be just a routine part of care. And when physicians learn how to do this, they love it because if, if you can imagine um, practicing in an environment where 30 or 40 percent of the people who come through your door um, have no explanation for their symptoms and you don't know what to do, that's tremendously frustrating and in fact, uh, burnout inducing for a lot of doctors. And then you can completely flip that 180 degrees. One doctor who uh, received some training from us in this area and she took me aside and said, you know, this work has put the joy back into my practice because now instead of these patients being frustrating dead ends, she knows what to do. 
Uh, she knows how, what to look for, what to diagnose, how to refer them to get the uh, exact help they need for the particular stress or stresses that they're coping with. Their symptoms get better. They're not necessarily cured on the spot, but they're at last on a pathway toward healing. It's, it's night and day for the doctors that learn how to do this. Do you, uh, when you teach physicians how to do this work, do you have them sort of be aware of the issue, be aware that we can express non-physical issues in physical ways, and then address that with people and then generally refer out to say a psychotherapist or another colleague who has either more time or more expertise in dealing with the stress aspect? Or, because I always feel like, you know, physicians are busy, they have limited time. And so I like that model, um, but there's always the risk of, um, sort of the, you know, having to see a psychotherapist or sort of switching fields. And so I'm just wondering how, what models you've seen in that regard. Yeah, what, what we teach is to begin with, with a uh, initial stress evaluation, we call it, and looking for the major types of stresses that uh, people are um, prone to have when they've got uh, a mind-body disorder and stress in your life right now. Uh, limited ability to do self-care skills, to, to spend time doing enjoyable things rather than taking care of everybody else in the world, stress uh, from the past, from uh, adverse childhood experiences is huge. It's present in a majority of people with mind-body disorders. Um, and then looking for mental health uh, conditions that are common in this population, uh, as you know, anxiety, depression, post-traumatic stress, and, you know, a physician can screen for those things, not necessarily all in one visit, but uh, depending on the length of time they have with each patient, but they can gather that information uh, over time. And once they uncover what's happening, depending on the complexity, then they have a, a variety of responses to that. They can um, take care of it themselves in many cases, because again, you're talking about 30 or 40% of their practice, so they're not gonna be able to refer out everybody uh, who's got a mind-body disorder. Uh, but they can um, handle a lot of it themselves uh, after the training that we provide. Uh, and when they can't, there's a, now, you know, not, as opposed to when I first started in the practice, there is today a lot of resources out there in terms of books that people can read, uh, videos, uh, webinars, um, lots of things that people can do to self-educate. Curable is, is the, the shining example of that. Uh, and I refer, you know, I, it's hard for me to imagine somebody I wouldn't refer Curable to. Um, and then finally, if, if it's really a complex issue and they've got some, you know, very serious stuff going on, they're, they're suicidal, they're, they're having um, uh, incapacitating anxiety, they've got overwhelming um, uh, stress from uh, childhood abuse, uh, you know, those kinds of, you know, very complex, uh, deep-rooted issues that are going to need a psychotherapist. Uh, then the psychotherapist is going to be able to, that, you know, that's within their, their sphere of expertise. Um, once those are uncovered, uh, you refer to the, the psychotherapist and you say, you don't have to worry about the physical symptoms. We've, we've uncovered the issues that we want you to focus on, and their most psychotherapists are going to feel comfortable um, with the um, uh, psychological aspects of this because that's what they've been trained uh, to do. And the, the physical symptoms will get better um, as a side benefit of that. So a, a wide range of people with uh, mind-body disorders uh, calling for a wide range of different uh, responses, but you know, well within the reach of um, normal frontline uh, primary care docs uh, around the world. Yeah. For those, uh, for those who are listening who aren't familiar with Curable, and there may be some people who are, it's an app that was developed five or six years ago. Uh, three of my friends were interested in potentially getting more information about mind-body medicine out. And so we would meet for breakfast periodically at the hospital in Chicago and they would tell me their ideas. And we were talking one day and they said, so Dr. Strax, so somebody sees you for mind-body medicine, they get better, they have a relapse, what do you do? And I said, 
well, I think, you know, oftentimes somebody will email me in the middle of the day, like I'm getting a really bad migraine, I don't know what it's about, and I'll email back and say, well, what happened yesterday, what's happening today, and what's happening tomorrow? And then I'll get an email back in about an hour saying, oh, thanks, I figured it out, I really appreciate it. And, and one of them, John or Eric or Laura said, Dr. Strax, we don't need you to do that, we can get an app to do that just fine. And so that was one of the ways that we recognized how effective this can be for people. I joke with them, and I probably said this to people before, but Clara is actually, Clara the bot who runs Curable, the app in Curable, is actually substantially more empathic than a lot of physicians who I've met. <laughs> over the course of my career and you know we can we you're can, right you know. i just it's terrible to say that but you're right i know they've done a really good job at making her empathic have you worked with them closely on any pieces uh you and i are both medical advisors to them but i don't know what specifically you've worked on with them in terms of helping to continue to make it a more and more effective tool yeah, um, two major areas, I would say. I mean, I met John probably back in 2017, um, and it might have been because you referred him to me. Uh, he moved to Denver, and I spent a lot of time in Denver with my grandchildren. And we started meeting for coffee um, at a mutually convenient uh, coffee shop and just talking over these issues the same way you did. Uh, and one of the ideas that I... Um, recommended was that they generalize curable from just focusing on migraines to um, working on the full range of mind-body issues because the principles are the same. I mean, this is something that you find out fairly quickly in doing this work, uh, as you know, that people with one mind-body disorder often have another one uh, at the same time, or, or many of them. My personal record patient had 27 different symptoms uh, that he was suffering from. So the, it's really the underlying causes that are important and not the, uh, the particular symptom that the person manifests with. So I thought it would be a pretty easy segue to go from a focus on migraines to a focus on all symptoms that don't have a biomedical explanation or an explanation in structural abnormalities or organ diseases. So that was one area that I, I recommended to him. The other was about the links between what are called ACEs, adverse childhood experiences, and uh, physical symptoms in the present day. Um, one of the mediating pathways between the two are various personality factors that uh, many workers in this field have identified, um, you know, they're, they're trying to be good all the time, trying to be helpful to others, uh, paying attention to details, not being very assertive about your own needs, uh, low self-esteem in many cases. Uh, all of these things that uh, Dr. Sarno um, pointed out uh, in his, his patients, uh, in his books, that Dr. Schechter in his books is called the, the type T personality. Uh, they all derive from uh, ways of coping with an adverse childhood environment. And if you can trace the, the roots of the patient's symptoms back through those personality features all the way to uh, what they experienced as children, it, makes, it facilitates the recovery, let's put it that way. And so I wanted to see if Curable could incorporate some of those ideas, and, and I went into a lot more depth, uh, obviously, than we can do here, but uh, incorporate a lot of those ideas uh, into Curable, and I felt that that would make Curable even more effective um, by bringing those concepts in, help, helping people to, uh, to see those issues in their own lives, because they're, as you know, they're, they're so huge uh, in people with mind-body symptoms. I think they've done a tremendous job in, in incorporating all of that. I think it was a big step for them to move from migraines, which it was initially, to all symptoms. And then they've done a fantastic job as well in talking with many of us around the country. And so getting the best of so many of us who do this work and being able to put it in there. And for those of you who haven't tried it, uh, curablehealth.com is the website for it and Dr. Park and I both highly recommend that as part of the tools that people are using 
for their healing. I'm going to switch gears just a little bit for a second. In this time of COVID and quarantine, I've been asking everybody who I come in contact with what their experience has been like with quarantine. And specifically, are there any things that you have done that have helped you get through this time? I don't know precisely what it's been like in Portland, but I assume it's like most of us in the rest of the country where you've been, I assume, told to, to stay inside and shelter and not have a lot of contact with people around you, I would think. Yeah, we're very lucky in Portland that we have uh, a very low rate of infection uh, in our community. And it's just, I think, brings the, the fear level down a lot when you know that it's uh, one out of every several hundred people out there rather than one out of every 50 that, that might be carrying the virus. So uh, that, that has helped us uh, in Portland. But you still, we still have the lockdown. Um, we have limited ourselves, my wife and I, to occasional visits with our, our son and his family who live three miles from us here in Portland. Um, and other than that, not seeing anybody for uh, two months now. Uh, and how to cope with this? Um, you know, there, um, there are a lot of ways that um, are of greater or lesser um, feasibility for different people, but we try to get outside to walk. Um, we, you know, we wear masks, we uh, distance from other people out there. We walk in areas that are, that are not popular so that uh, uh, we don't run into too many people, but we try to walk um, three, four miles a day uh, just to get outside, uh, get uh, what sunshine there is, um, and then get some exercise. So that's, that's important. Um, having a routine, uh, I think, uh, is helpful. Um, try to get dressed in regular clothes, uh, make the bed, uh, have uh, meals at, at certain times and not just kind of eat all day long. Um, we limit uh, how much uh, news we take in. You know, we'll read newspapers either online or uh, in physical form uh, in the morning. We'll listen to uh, evening news on the radio and then the rest of the day try not to pay uh, too much attention so we're not getting overwhelmed by um, all the badness that's going on out there. Um, and we, uh, we use the technological tools to stay connected uh, with our friends and family. Uh, we have, as I mentioned, uh, family in Denver. Uh, and we've got you know, all of our friends here in Portland and some others uh, around the country that uh, we can connect with um, technologically and uh, you know, share a meal with uh, or a beverage um, over the screen. And that helps a lot too. Any hidden benefits of quarantine for you? It's another question I've been asking a lot of people lately. So for me, I started doing yoga almost every morning with recorded classes from Thousand Petals Yoga Studio in Chapel Hill, North Carolina, who put together this great online resource for yogis. And my yoga and flexibility has gotten much better in quarantine. We've had a lot of family walks down to the lake that we probably wouldn't have taken. And we have taken to coming down to my office. My office is being used uh, for a remote studio for me. It's being used for a remote classroom for my kids because the Wi-Fi here is much better than at home. And we have a 75 inch screen that we've actually never used in our uh, resource room here. And so we come down every weekend and we slowly working our way through the Marvel Avenger movie series. So <laughs> I think we're eight movies into the 23 movie series, but there are things that we wouldn't necessarily have done. And clearly like nobody wants quarantine, but there have been these small hidden benefits that I've seen people find in the midst of um, a difficult situation. Yeah. And they're, they're, um, there are some, uh, you know, I, every year I teach uh, in two different grad schools uh, and it's always been by a webinar because the students are all over the country. And so that's um, came along uh, at the perfect time. It started uh, two months ago and just finished uh, my first one. Then I'll be starting the second one um, at the beginning of July. And, you know, I love my students and they're forever sending me, you know, the written work uh, that I have to comment on in grades. So it, it kept me pretty busy uh, 
uh, for the last two months. Um, and the, the work of the PPD Association uh, has, for me, always been uh, online. As I mentioned, my executive director is in New York City, so we interact uh, technologically uh, on a regular basis. More fun things is, you know, I always have more books than I have time to read. Uh, my office is just, you know, loaded with things that, oh, that looks interesting and that looks interesting. And I've never had, you know, my, and my ambition to read them is greater than the time that I have uh, to actually do that. But I'm getting to look at stuff that um, I wouldn't have otherwise. I'm reading a history of the city of Portland. Um, there's a, a friend of mine who uh, walked across uh, Antarctica and wrote a book about the experience. So I'm looking at that um, and lots of, you know, random topics that uh, I might never have had access to uh, otherwise. So speaking of books, uh, you wrote the book, They Can't Find Anything Wrong, which came out about 10 or so years ago. And so we're going to move into the question and answer in just a minute. And there are already about 15 questions waiting for us. Oh. For those of you who are listening and want to put more questions in there, we have the time. And so if you want to, the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen, just go ahead and click on that. You can type in whatever you want and send, us to, send it to us here in our studio. But before we get to the Q&A, there are obviously a number of patients who have done well, who showed up in your book, but any nice stories that you want to share with people about patients who have done well with their symptoms after recognizing what the cause of them was? You know, uh, yeah, the, the book has uh, got four dozen different stories uh, in there. And uh, a lot of those people i love to tell their stories because you know their improvements were uh, so dramatic uh, and oftentimes very rapid i mean the first story in the book is a woman who had been hospitalized at a major university 60 times in 15 years and they still didn't know what was wrong with her and she was cured with a one-hour conversation but i you know i have a, a soft spot in my heart for the the 74 year old lumberjack uh, who had been ill for 55 years that I mentioned before. And, and he was a man of very few words. I mean, you, you need communication skills to, to get over uh, psychophysiologic disorders. And he just didn't have them. I mean, I would ask him a question and he would give me a two or three word answer. And I'm going, oh my gosh, you know, I'm, I'm, how am I gonna help this man? Fortunately, his wife was there and she would fill in the details. And, uh, to make a long story short, he'd been physically abused by his dad on an you know, extremely regular basis, and he finally couldn't take it anymore, and he just walked away from his home when he was 15 and began working in the woods. You know, we got lots of timber here in the state of Oregon, and that that's, was his job for until he retired at 65. But, but he started having his physical symptoms when he was 19, and he rarely went for more than a week or so without having those. And uh, he'd been with the same health insurance firm for you know decades, and they nothing ever turned up. Uh, but I, I sent him to a class that we had at that time for uh, adult children of dysfunctional families. It was two hours a week for eight weeks, and he came back after the class, and he hadn't had any symptoms. And so I asked him to tell me, you know, what happened in the class? You know, and what happened was he sat through the first two, you know, there was a lot of mutual sharing going on with this, this small group of people about the abuse that they had suffered. And he just wasn't willing to open up. And first two hours goes by, next week he comes back, two more hours go by, doesn't say a word. Third class, finally, a couple of sentences about himself. And, but it was a pretty savvy class at that point. And everybody just kind of sits back and waits. And there's this long, awkward pause. And finally, he yields to the, to the group pressure and starts talking about himself again. And he can't stop. And he goes on for 35 or 40 minutes telling his story to this very supportive, very open uh, group of people. And for him, that was the moral equivalent of a Russian novel. I mean, to speak for that long, that many words. And that was it. I mean, just... It, and it's a principle I've seen, uh, you know, over and over again, as I know you have, uh, that if you can convert your emotions into words, then they don't have to express themselves as symptoms. 
And that was, that was the case for him. After that third class, he finished the other five classes, didn't have any symptoms that whole five weeks, came back to see me a few weeks after that, still no symptoms. As far as I know, he's been fine to this day. Amazing. Do you have thoughts for people who don't get better right away, who tap into the emotions, who go to the classes, who use curable, who struggle with this, but still their symptoms linger? Yes. The, um, the process that I've seen very often, a, a person can be making steady progress um, mentally without any physical benefit for a long time. So that in a sense, what's happening to them, the benefit that's happening for them is going on beneath the surface. And it can take a long time of, uh, and a lot of work before those, that surface manifestation, the benefit to the symptoms uh, begins to kick in. So it, you know, it has to do with the, the severity of the stresses that a person went through. It has to do with the, the resilience factors that, that they bring to the table, which you know, often is just something people were born with uh, or has a lot to do with whether they experienced any forms of support when they were growing up. I mean, did you have a kind grandmother who believed in you or did you not? You know, there's a big difference between those two uh, phenomena. But the, the, the key concept is keep working at it, keep going in the same direction, keep uh, thinking, keep writing, keep uh, uh, contemplating what emotions might be in there, use the symptoms as a uh, signal that there's a, a stress issue going on that you need to uh, get in touch with and figure out, find a good therapist, um, and eventually all of those pieces of the puzzle you know, it may take, you know, it may be that you've done 90% of the work that you need to do before you see any benefit to your symptoms, but you're not wasting your time. Um, there was a woman on the Facebook uh, curable group just here recently who was 70 years old, found curable and got better right away. And the reason I'm, I'm convinced was that she, you know, she'd been having symptoms since she was a teenager. She'd been working on this for 50 years and curable was the last piece of the puzzle. So. Um, it, it just sometimes takes uh, lots of putting together of pieces before at the very end, you finally see the benefit. So I tell people, yeah, I tell people faith. about that model a lot where you sort of, you're doing a lot of the work under the surface, which I see. And then at some point it starts to coalesce and the physical symptoms get better as well. So we're going to move into the Q&A. And so it looks like there's about 20 questions waiting for us. We'll try to get through as many as we can. We've got almost 60 people on the call at the moment. And so the first question actually is about reflux. This was sent to me in my office earlier this week. So uh, gastro, gastroesophageal reflux disease, GERD, and this specific question actually about laryngopharyngeal reflux reflux, LPR, do you think that those can be manifestations of mind-body disease? And if so, do you think that this type of treatment can help them? Yes, uh, you know, gastroesophageal reflux and laryngopharyngeal reflux are, you know, that's just basically a more severe form where stomach contents uh, reflux, which means they come up the esophagus and they get all the way up uh, to the larynx area and can cause damage to the larynx, which is the, your voice box, very delicate tissues uh, in there. And the um, stress can affect the muscle contractions of the GI tract uh, in such a way that that reflux uh, is more likely to happen. Uh, it, there is not always a uh, psychophysiologic component to that. You know, we, we can't say that it's, you know, um, 100% of the time that it's a mind-body concern, but very often it is, and it's well worth doing the stress evaluation to find out what issues, um, psychological issues, stress issues, trauma issues might be going on in a particular person, and then address those issues and see if you get better. That's, that's pretty much the, the same answer to uh, this kind of question um, 
no matter what the symptom is, um, you know, people say, well, I have symptom X, Y, Z, could it be a mind body issue? And the answer is almost always, yes, it could be. Uh, sometimes it's 95% certain that it is a mind-body issue. Other times it's only 5% of the time is it a mind-body issue. But the answer is very often yes, there could be a mind-body component to this. And to, we don't have a diagnostic test to tell us. So what we need to do is find out what are your stress issues, bring those out into the surface, treat them, and see if you get better. That's the only way to find out how much of your particular version of these symptoms uh, is mind-body related. I think with reflux specifically, I've read some that they think that there are many people who have physiological reflux into their esophagus who walk around feeling just fine. And so there's more to the story than just what's going on in the body, which is true for so many mind-body disorders. And so I've definitely seen people who have worked on their reflux specifically. And then I've also seen people who've worked on their back pain and have gotten that better and come back and say, oh, by the way, my reflux went away mm -hmm. as well. And so we see it regularly. The next question says, 35-year-old, um, fair amount of trauma, in her life, recently moved to a new place and finds that it's harder and harder to keep the emotions and trauma down. And so has been to a lot of physicians, everything is quote, normal, and tries to do this work, but sort of slips in and out of being able to do it effectively. And so you have, do we have ideas for how to continue with this work when the work tends to get a little bit overwhelming? Yeah, it's a hard question to answer without knowing a lot more detail about the person themselves. Um, I was very blessed that I had 60 minute appointments uh, with each of my patients where I could talk to them in great detail about exactly what they had gone through. Um, the fact that something feels overwhelming, uh, that you may experience being in a what some people call a brain fog, um, is an indication that your brain is working extremely hard on these things, and that's a really good sign. Uh, you know, even as bad as it feels, even though that the traumas may feel uh, overwhelming, uh, at least they are uh, being processed uh, by your brain and that your brain is, is working as hard on this as it possibly can. And you can have uh, a lot of confidence that all of that work is going to pay off uh, eventually. So yes, it, it's a very difficult experience to go through, um, but it is going to be a benefit for you uh, in the long run. One concept that uh, is helpful to many people, not necessarily everybody, but many people who are going through this experience is to write a letter to the person who mistreated them when they were growing up. Not, not to mail it, just to write it, to sit down. And, and there are a lot of different varieties of writing exercises that, that people can do. Uh, this is only one of them, but it's been very helpful to a lot of my patients to sit down and write um, all the thoughts and feelings they have about this person, especially if that person is still active in their life. That, that is even more difficult to cope with than if they are completely gone uh, out of your life. But to write down thoughts and emotions, the more you put onto a piece of paper or onto a computer screen, the less of that needs to go into your body to express itself. I think too, if there's a lot of trauma involved, oftentimes it's very hard to work through this on our own. And so finding a trusted professional to work with sometimes can make the entire difference between being able to move forward or not. And sometimes that's possible. Sometimes it's not possible. I actually did a podcast on Curable last year talking about my experience of leaving the hospital and setting up my own practice which was super fun and it's been fantastic and it's been quite stressful as well. And so had a relapse in symptoms in ways that I hadn't in, in a couple of decades. And so talk about how 
I needed to reach out to some colleagues who do different kind of work and have people help me through it because it just wasn't a situation that I could get through completely on my own. And so reaching out and asking for help is oftentimes difficult, but can make a huge difference. I think specifically for trauma, with colleagues who work in the fields of sensory motor psychotherapy and somatic experiencing, which are forms of psychotherapy that are very much body-based and, and also were developed to aid in the healing of trauma. And so if there's options to find people who have expertise in those modalities, it can make a big difference in how people can move forward trying to heal the experiences that they've had. Yeah, absolutely agree with that. And don't hesitate to do a pre-interview with anybody you're considering uh, to be your psychotherapist and make sure you feel comfortable with them and um, that you feel that they can help you. And if they're helping you, great. If they're not helping you after a couple of visits, don't hesitate to move on. It can take some time to find uh, somebody who's a good connection for you. It's, it's not like fixing a fractured leg where most orthopedic surgeons are going to be able to do that for you with, with skill. Um, when it comes to psychotherapy, a lot depends on the, uh, the connection between the two people. Next question is about food sensitivities. And so you probably get this a lot. I get this a lot. There's a lot of talk about food sensitivities in our culture these days. How much do you think that that's an issue versus how much of it is more likely to be a mind-body issue? Well, in the case of food sensitivity, it's probably over 90% are mind-body issues, um, probably not quite that high for uh, various forms of reflux. But with food sensitivity, it's so common for someone who's got a gastrointestinal symptom to blame whatever it is they just ate uh, on, on that symptom uh, for causing that symptom. And then you add on to that the fact that there are numerous uh, tests out there that people can get that will um, that at least uh, purport to identify when you have a, a food sensitivity or food allergy. And the, the tests are mostly uh, invalid. Um, and even the, the gold standard, which is a, you know, a double blind uh, uh, test of uh, you know, giving you a food that you feel like you're sensitive to, there are, there are issues with that uh, as well. So it's, it's very hard to, um, to give people um, a clear cut diagnosis of whether they have a food sensitivity or allergy or not. The, I think the best we can do in a, in a short space of time here is that if you've got a food that gives you symptoms 10 times out of 10, uh, then that's probably something to stay away from uh, for the time being. Um, and you should also, if there's some concern about um, sensitivity to, to gluten or uh, and related compounds, that you should be tested for sprue because that is a reliable test uh, that we can do for you. Um, but short of that, um, you know, if you've only got symptoms some of the time with a particular food, that's probably not uh, a true food allergy. You know, a true food allergy is a biochemical phenomenon that's going to happen um, almost every single time when you put that substance uh, in your GI tract. So if, you're, if it's only happening some of the time, go for the mind-body issues. And even if it's happening almost all the time, still work on the mind-body issues and then give yourself a shot at trying that food again after you've made some improvement uh, in the mind-body area. I agree, and I'm not uh, opposed to taking people off of various foods, gluten being a common one, sometimes dairy, but I also see people who come to my office having taken out dozens or sometimes hundreds of foods out of their diet, and oftentimes without a huge resolution in symptoms. And so the more foods that people are supposedly sensitive to, the more I'm thinking about a mind-body explanation and adding in that form of treatment for people. Yeah. And the same kind of thing applies to small intestinal bacterial overgrowth or SIBO. Um, you know, there, there are people who actually have that, but only a small fraction of the number of people who think they have it. So this next question is about a flare up. It says the pain was triggered by a concussion and has done a lot of this work and gotten better. But now there's eye pain and trouble with eye related activities and all, no matter what they do and exposure or otherwise, it continues to flare and there's panic as well. And so complicated situation. 
that's quite overwhelming. Um, is there a good way to approach those kinds of complex disorders that don't have an obvious answer right away? Any thoughts about that? I know that's not GI related, so not necessarily in your purview, but any, yeah, any but I'm, you know, that? as with you, I mean, the, even though I started out in gastrointestinal medicine, the patients that came to see me over the years had a wider and wider range of symptoms. Um, and, you know, the answer, you know, again, to the question that so many people have, here is my particular symptom X, Y, and Z, and could it be mind-body related, and what can I do? And the answer is very often the same, is to evaluate for sources of stress. Um, what stresses are you having in your life at the moment? The fact that there's a strong anxiety component uh, in this person's symptom uh, suggests to me that uh, a high likelihood of a mind-body uh, connection. Of course, you want to have uh, a physician, but potentially uh, a specialist, uh, look at uh, the eye situation and make sure there's not an organ disease or a structural abnormality going on. If they find you know, nothing of that sort, then that significantly increases the chances that um, mind-body issues are the cause. And you can, have, you can go forward with even more confidence um, looking for those. So stresses in your life at the moment. Um, are you the kind of person that takes care of everybody else in your world but has difficulty putting yourself on the list of people you take care of? Um, did you have significant adverse childhood experiences? And the best question for that is when you look back at your own childhood, if you imagine a child that you care about growing up exactly the same way you did, how would that make you feel? Would, would, would you be sad or angry to see a kid trying to cope with everything you had to cope with as a child? Think about that for a while. Maybe do some journaling about that for a while. That can help you connect with some emotions that perhaps uh, you didn't know were there. And then finally, you know, lots of people with depression don't feel that depressed, but they, they are manifesting their depression uh, in a physical way. And the same can be true of post-traumatic stress and uh, anxiety disorders and in many cases addressing those you know addressing the anxiety that this person uh, mentioned um, that alone may be sufficient to uh, provide some relief and interestingly i do see a lot of eye symptoms as part of mind body medicine and there are a lot of my patients especially when there's a lot a lot of trauma and a history of abuse, it seems to come out in the eyes. And so I would be confident that the eyes can be part of this whole package. And so at some point we can stop looking for physical explanations and really focus there. And this next question is, uh, is similar. So symptoms that bounce around from place to place, especially if they're in the same part of the body. So throat, neck, teeth, jaw, reflux. What's the best way to not get sidetracked into thinking that these are physical disorders that need evaluation and be confident that you can work on them in a mind-body way? Well, the... Um... The more symptoms bounce around, the more likely they are to have mind-body as a cause. You know, when you think about it, I mean, a tumor isn't going to bounce around. Something that's infected isn't going to bounce around. Uh, so that's a, an excellent sign that you're dealing with a, a mind-body condition when the symptoms uh, migrate around. We have uh, on the ppdassociation.org website, a list of 30 questions um, that I put together with uh, one of your other guests, Howard Schumanner, in the past. Uh, and the more of those questions that you answer yes to, the more likely it is that there's a mind-body condition uh, underlying the symptoms. So people can uh, go to the website and, and look at those. There's also a downloadable uh, hidden stress screening questionnaire just nine questions that are designed with a, a little guide to help you interpret the results um, that you can do to screen yourself for sources of stress that might be uh, underlying the symptom. But that, that's a, uh, a key indicator that mind-body um, issues are responsible for the symptoms when they move from place to place in the body. 
Yeah. And like I was saying, being confident that these are mind body medicine issues that it's never wrong to have it evaluated, but after you've been evaluated a couple of times or for a lot of our patients, a couple of dozen of times, it really is part of the cure to work on how to reassure yourself that you're in the right place. And, you know, clearly for patients who are part of my practice, they can always reach out and get my feedback on that. If you're not part of my practice, you know, after you've had the message and had the experience a few times of finding out that you're physically cleared and you can get better using mind body medicine techniques, you try to somehow keep that in mind so that you don't have to go back and constantly reevaluate whether it's, it's physical or not in its origin. Yep. Use those symptoms as a, your body trying to tell you something that it's it wants you to look for the source of stress it's it's a it's a gift it's a guide yeah any thoughts about how to find a good tms therapist well finding any therapist is going to be heavily dependent on your relationship with that person um, are they understanding do you, do you feel understood when you talk to this person um, do you feel like you've been heard do you feel like um, you are gaining insight uh, into yourself through your interactions with that person? And if you don't feel that after a couple of visits, then you should move on. And it's, it's painful to um, have to conduct a, a search like that, especially when it takes you know, a couple of visits and a certain amount of money to, uh, um, to conduct a, a search for a good therapist. But you know, this is your life. And, um, Finding someone who is uh, well connected with you, who helps you um, make progress, um, is um, ideal. And it's it's not unusual to take um, uh, to go through more than one individual before you find the right one for yourself. Um, we also have um, uh, directories uh, available on the ppdassociation.org website. And there's one on the TMS wiki um, of people that have uh, expressed an interest and developed some expertise uh, in mind body issues. So that's often a good place to start. Many of those therapists are willing to work uh, via technology uh, over the internet. And so they don't have to be uh, physically present in your city. And I had put an answer to a question on the Curable Facebook page with a couple of my colleagues, the psychotherapy colleagues who had specifically volunteered to work with people by, uh, by Skype or FaceTime as opposed to in person. And so I, I put that answer up a couple of weeks ago. I also think, like I said, that my colleagues in sensory motor psychotherapy and somatic experiencing have a lot of knowledge of being able to work in the body. And so they are oftentimes good matches. And then this particular question actually said that one of the issues is trying to figure out ways to get anger out. It turns out that a surprising number of psychotherapists aren't great at working with people's emotions. I think there are complicated reasons for that, but I was talking to Dr. Schubiner one time who did a study on helping people with emotions in medically unexplained symptoms, I think specifically for fibromyalgia. And he was complaining to me about how difficult it was for people to enter into the world of emotions. I was like, Howard, like, it's hard for people. What do you expect? He's like, I'm not talking about the patients. I'm talking about the therapists. Oh. And so being checking and getting a sense of whether the therapist is comfortable with the emotions, I think is an important thing to do as well. Yeah, there's, there's good evidence um, on, on that, that, um, you know, how you feel about the relationship with the therapist, you know, do you feel heard, understood, making progress, those three areas. Um, and as long as those three, three things are happening, then you're in a good place. If they're not happening, um, then talk to the therapist about it. Make sure they know that it's not happening for you and see if you can find a way um, to change the situation. Otherwise, you know, you may just not be uh, compatible or the benefit of that person, uh, may have reached its limits, um, and that's okay. Um, keep looking. Next question is about pudendal neuralgia after a routine colonoscopy. As a gastroenterologist, what's your thought about that? The symptoms are uncomfortable, been to pelvic, physical therapy. 
had fear going into the colonoscopy and has some PTSD from other health experience as well. Do you think there's any possibility that there's a structural issue related to the colonoscopy or is it possible that it's mind-body related? The, the odds are that it's mind-body related. I, I can't tell you how many thousands of colonoscopies I've done and I've never had a patient who uh, developed pudendal neuralgia from one, but there's um, abundant evidence of pudendal neuralgia, pelvic pain, uh, persistent genital arousal disorder uh, being connected to um, mind-body concerns. So that's, that's the most likely explanation. Uh, one uh, study that I love to quote from the University of Washington, now 30 years old, was of um, two groups of women with pelvic pain who were undergoing laparoscopies. And the women with the pain, about a third of them had something wrong in their pelvis when they looked in there with the metal tube, which is the laparoscope. But it turned out that a third of the women without the pain also had those same abnormalities. So, you know, endometriosis, which is lining of the uterus that's leaked out into the pelvis or scar tissue, adhesions, ovarian cysts, that sort of thing. But in one group, no pain whatsoever. So probably not causing the pain uh, in the other group. And even in the group with the pain, uh, two thirds of those women had no abnormalities uh, in their pelvis at all. So this, the researchers went on to investigate other potential causes uh, for the pelvic pain and ask all the women in both groups if they'd been sexually abused as girls. And it was about 20% of the women with no pain which is unfortunately about average for adult American women. But in the group with the pain, it was 64%. So it doesn't prove cause and effect necessarily, but does show a strong link between a, a source of a huge stress and physical symptoms uh, later on in life. And that, that kind of association has cropped up in my practice over and over and over again. So likelihood is that the uh, pudendal neuralgia in this patient uh, is connected to some form of stress rather than to the colonoscopy. Agreed. And so the next question is related, which is speaking to trauma with a small T as opposed to trauma with a capital T. And so we clearly recognize physical abuse, sexual abuse, uh, abandonment as traumatic experiences. But what about emotional neglect or attachment trauma that this person asks about? Has your experience, and I can speak to this too, but has your experience been that those kinds of issues can bring up symptoms? Yeah, those are, those are trauma with a capital T. Um, that's, that was one of the things that I had to learn early in my practice career was that uh, emotional neglect, um, even just treatment of the child in such a way that nothing they do is ever good enough. You know, that they person no matter how hard they try as a kid, you know, they'll run through walls to get some praise from their parents and, and it just isn't happening. They, or if they do get a little bit of praise, the next time the, the bar of achievement that they have to reach to, to get praise from the family or from the parents is just raised that much more and it always seems to be out of reach and so they're, they're always failing. Anything that makes you feel like a second rate human being uh, is trauma with a capital T. And it can have the same long-term impacts as more obvious forms of trauma like sexual abuse. And I, I, I would not have guessed that 30 years ago. And this person also specifically talked about her mother and her mother's anxiety and the connection between her own emotions and her mother's emotions. And so this concept of setting solid boundaries, which I talk with people about all the time, but a lot of people grow up in families where the boundaries aren't clear between physical, um, what belongs to whom physically, what belongs to whom emotionally or psychologically. People aren't able to keep their own thoughts and emotions separate from other family members. And my patients who have learned to be able to draw those boundaries and draw them effectively get huge physical relief in being able to do that. One story that I tell regularly as a patient of mine with chronic fatigue syndrome who came in my office one day and I said, how are you? She said, I'm great. And I was like, really, you're, you're rarely say that you're great. What's going on? She's like, I stopped talking to my mother. 
And that's not necessarily a prescription for anybody else, but for her, like she drew that solid boundary and freed up all this energy that she was using to manage that relationship that she didn't recognize that she yeah. was. Using. Yeah, it's, um, it is a great story to hear um, just the, the long-term power of those experiences. You know, when you've got a mother who's anxious, which is, you know, the, the questioner that you were mentioning, the, the child in that family is going to try to solve that anxiety and they are going to fail. And so they are going to get that sense of themselves as a second rate human being. And they will be, that will put them on a treadmill where they are always trying to fix uh, problems that they don't have the capability of fixing. And it, it distracts their attention from their own needs onto the needs of everybody else. And that's not sustainable. Uh, your body is going to protest. If you don't have the ability to get off of that treadmill and focus on your own needs, that's an essential human skill, the ability to tell everybody else to take a hike and just do something that has no purpose but your own joy. A lot of my patients just simply did not have the ability to do that. And, and until they learned it, um, they were gonna keep on having symptoms. Another um, excellent point about that uh, case is that in order to draw um, those boundaries between yourself and a toxic person in your life, you have to feel worthy. You have to feel like you deserve to have that boundary drawn there. And one of the best ways to feel worthy is, again, to go back to that idea of imagining a child you care about growing up exactly the way you did and how heroic and, and the perseverance of that child and to endure in that environment and begin to think about that child that was you um, in, in heroic terms. And the more you recognize uh, that they were born on the far side of a dangerous mountain and had to climb up and over to get to be an adult, the more respect you're gonna have for what that little kid accomplished, which translates into more respect for yourself which translates into the strength to put those boundaries down and, and feeling worthy of having those boundaries uh, be there. Absolutely. So um, we are, these are awesome questions and we're making zero headway because every time we answer one, two more pop up. But it's, so it's 645. Do you have 15 more minutes to stay and answer a couple more questions? Yeah, absolutely. I'm okay. happy to do it. So we'll, uh, we'll add on a bonus 15 minutes and end right about seven o'clock. Chicago time. So this next question is from a sister of one of my patients about chronic cough for nine years, been evaluated. It's not a lung problem. It doesn't look like it's infected. Uh, started a year after her husband died, has drawn all sorts of acupuncture diets, has been to an alternative medicine center in Minneapolis. And any suggestions about how to move forward and can she consult with you when she's in Portland, she says. Um, you know, I, I don't really see patients so much anymore, but I, every once in a while, if uh, somebody is referred by somebody I know, like yourself, John, so that mm -hmm. would be fine. Um, you know, I, I limit it to uh, a handful of people that I know well who send me cases and I see one or two people a month uh, that way. So um, that would be fine. I typically meet with people in a, in a coffee shop, but sometimes I'll use uh, technology to uh, interview people as well. And uh, again, happy to do that when I get it, the person is referred by somebody that I know. But that particular situation, I mean, my approach would be to do uh, what I call a stress evaluation. And we've talked about the various components of that. Uh, uh, what are the stresses today? How are the person's uh, self-care skills? What ACEs, adverse childhood experiences, did they have? Do they have uh, symptoms of depression, PTSD, or anxiety? And usually come up with uh, one or more of those issues that uh, haven't been uncovered or addressed successfully and the symptoms will make progress when we do. I also, you know, this particular situation started after her husband died. And so whenever I hear that kind of timing, that's where I focus in most of my attention. And Absolutely. so would want to be considering the grief aspect. And there's, there's an interesting study 
was a while ago in uh, pediatrics, interestingly, about lingering coughs and hypnosis as a modality for getting the coughs to go away, sort of explaining to the children that the cough had its place and did its job, and now it's lingering past its welcome point. And so it's okay to thank the cough for what it did and allow it to go away. And the children in the study had significant improvement in that particular symptom. And so I would be wondering about both of those. Are there ways that we can get a sense of what the cough was doing there and allow it to go away? And is there something about the grieving process that is incomplete or unfinished or still needs to happen? Those would be the things that I was thinking about. And so- Absolutely. Um, yeah, you're reminding me of a patient whom I uh, had write a letter to her husband who was deceased and things came out in the letter that she didn't know were in her mind. Yeah. And so happy to consult if the person's in Chicago visiting her sister and happy to get information out to you, Dave, in Portland you when she's out there. Thoughts about talking with others, people who've gotten better but still have trouble convincing other people that this is a meaningful way to, to get relief? Well, we, we wish that people who got better would tell their physicians, for one. Uh, I know the, the common question is about, you know, I, I've run into somebody at work or I have a relative who's got these issues and I really want to tell them uh, how much better I got. Uh, we have on the ppdassociation.org website um, a letter um, that people can copy or, or adapt, uh, one to be given to the person's physician and another to explain the situation to loved ones um, that was written by uh, several board members of the PPD Association. So it's got a lot of good ideas uh, in both of those. And you know, you're not always gonna get the response uh, that you would like to get. A lot of people are simply not ready to address the psychosocial stresses that are underlying their illness. I had one patient very memorably said after we had our discussion, you know, doctor, I think you're right, but I just can't go there right now. And the, and the tears were streaming down her face and I, I never saw her again. I hope that she followed up on the uh, suggestions that I gave her and uh, made progress. But at least at that particular moment, uh, she um, wasn't ready. And that's certainly the case with a lot of uh, uh, friends, coworkers, and loved ones that we would love to be able to show the pathway that, that we have followed that's led to progress for ourselves. I always figure that I think between one in 10 and one in 100 people somewhere in there is ready to hear about this as a solution. And hopefully that will increase, continue to increase over time. It, there are you know, literally hundreds of thousands of people who are eager to hear about this information. That's what Curable has shown. But because of the world the way it is, especially in terms of coronavirus, the odds of standing next to a person who's ready to understand this, I think is small. But when you start to expand the community, then you find a lot of people who are ready to hear about it. And so when people are talking to the person next to them, whether it's a family member or a partner or someone at a cocktail party, odds are that they're not necessarily ready. But I also think that people need to hear it oftentimes 10 or 30 or 100 times before they're ready to really move forward with it. And so yeah. that's why you and I do this work of getting this word out here so that people can hear it more and more often. I also go back to what I was saying a minute ago about the boundaries. It's not any of our jobs, even mine, to convince somebody to treat their symptoms in this way. And so if somebody comes in and wants to know what they can do for a symptom, I'll throw this out there. But if they're not ready, I don't push them in that direction. I use any other tool that they are ready for food sensitivities or other to try to help as best as I can. But I try to keep in mind that my responsibility is to get the information out, but it's not to make somebody understand what they're not ready to understand. Yeah, I, I completely agree. And I, I would just add that uh, if our viewers try to share this information with people and they get shun, shut down 10 times out of 10, 
you may be planting a seed. You know, that, that person that shut you down uh, 12 months from now, they may remember what you told them and start acting on it. Yeah. Couple more questions. Inflammatory arthritis or fibromyalgia? Question or thoughts about either of those? Well, fibromyalgia is very well known to be a mind body condition, and there's not been any other cause found for it. And there is research now that shows that a mind body approach has more benefits than any other. Um, Howard Schubiner, one of John Strack's previous guests and well-known in the field, along with his colleague, uh, Dr. Lumley, has done uh, outstanding research on this and uh, found that people who can identify and express uh, the underlying emotions, what's called emotional awareness and expression therapy, uh, <clears throat> make more progress than with any other form of treatment that's been found so far. So um, it's, it's excellent for um, this approach. Um, I also, fibromyalgia clearly is, um, can be treated by mind-body as you were just saying and, and the studies that have shown that. The inflammatory arthritis, if somebody comes into my office with that, I will take a, a more comprehensive approach. I'll bring up mind-body ideas, but also work on supplements, changing medications around what people are eating. And so I would rarely treat inflammatory arthritis just as a mind-body disease, even though I think there's definitely a component of that. Yeah, that is more likely uh to have um, a um, organ disease uh, cause to it, let's put it that way. Um, in, in any individual, you can't tell if some significant fraction of their symptoms might be mind-body related, but it's likely to be smaller than with fibromyalgia. Yeah. Howard and I actually also did an unpublished study on fibromyalgia where we interviewed people about the amount of trauma that they had experienced, and it was, it was literally so unspeakable that I couldn't even figure out how to like co coordinate the data and start to write it up. But whenever, because I've had that experience in that research, I know that if I see somebody with fibromyalgia, I at least need to consider the possibility that there's a trauma component to it. Yeah, that, I had the same shocking experience with my irritable bowel patients. I, I thought I would see five or six a year that had uh, a history of trauma and it turned out to be five or six a week. Yeah. Any thoughts about triggers? So knowing, for instance, that sitting in a certain chair isn't the cause of pain, but still can't bring themselves to do that. Um, the, the same principles apply, I think. Um, you know, when uh, you are sitting in a chair at work, for example, and you get progressively symptomatic, uh, but you sit in a chair at home and you're fine, you know, that is a clear indication that it's not the chair. Uh, and then you can use that symptom to focus on, okay, if it's not the chair, what is it? You know, what are the, the stress issues that are uh, really behind my symptoms? And start working with that. Curable can help people identify them. Uh, the various books on the, in the field can do that. A psychotherapist can help you with that. A uh, mind-body trained physician can help with that. Um, you know, the, if the person doesn't have an organ disease or a structural abnormality that explains why the trigger is causing the problem, then we need to look elsewhere. Symptoms happen for a reason. That's the, the first line of the new psychophysiologic disorders textbook. And if it's not an organ disease or a structural abnormality, we need to find the stress that, that is the uh, underlying cause. And I also, I'm working on a handout actually. And so if you want to contact my office and get this just about using graded exposure to deal with triggers. And so imagining being in that situation and bringing up the stress so that you can learn how to deal with it just in your mind and then very slowly moving into those situations and practicing sitting in a chair for three seconds and see how you do and then gradually increasing the amount of time. And so I think that with the triggers, we can use some of these cognitive techniques to, uh, to allow people to gradually experience it and, uh, and get used to it so that they teach their body 
how to be in those situations. That, that is a great idea. I, I didn't encounter as many people with uh, spine issues uh, mm -hmm. in my practice, so I, I like that idea a lot. Yeah. Uh, somebody wrote in about a seven centimeter ovarian cyst, so it's big, and whether this could be a TMS manifestation. I don't think so. I think that falls yeah. into the organ disease category. Yeah, I would be hesitant about trying to treat uh, an ovarian cyst with mind-body techniques, meditation, writing, or otherwise. And so I would probably work with a gynecologist on that too, uh, to figure out what the right solution is there. Um, decreasing medication when dealing with a GI symptom that's responding well to TMS therapy, specifically this one with inflammatory bowel disease, which is a little bit different than IBS. Yeah, inflammatory bowel disease incorporates uh, Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. And it is possible to have irritable bowel syndrome at the same time. And consequently, when a person develops a flare up of symptoms, it can be a challenge to decide, well, is it the inflammatory bowel disease or is it the irritable bowel syndrome that is responsible for the flare up of symptoms? And it, um, an experienced gastrointestinal physician can often tell from the nature of the symptoms, um, which one of those two it is, but there's enough overlap that sometimes you can't tell and you have to actually do a colonoscopy or, uh, a barium x-ray of the GI tract to find out if the inflammation is active uh, in that person. And if it is, you treat that. If the inflammation is not active, then you'd go toward more of a mind-body approach. Um, and it it's, can be very, very challenging situation for a physician to sort out um, what's happening there. And I've definitely coached some people through decreasing their medication on inflammatory bowel disease, but it's, it's slow and it can be hard and there is some risk to it. And so I don't know that I would necessarily want someone to do it on their own, but I would say that in the right situations, I've definitely seen people able to do that. Um, there's a question here about Hashimoto's disease, which is autoimmune thyroid disease. I'll take that because I do a lot of work with thyroid disease, and autoimmune disease in people. And so again, it's an autoimmune. So I wouldn't treat it just as a mind-body medicine issue, but there's comprehensive plans that are, I've seen people both manage the Hashimoto's disease much better with thyroid medication and slowly reduce the antibodies. This again is part of that, but it's not the only solution. But um, I'm always happy to consult with people with any kind of thyroid issue about what could be helpful for them. And we got down to our last question. So small bowel resection three weeks ago and some challenges with digestion. Uh, are there any tips to accepting foods into the diet now that they've been able to eat, uh, that I haven't been able to eat for years due to the bowel problems? I still have a lot of fear and now diarrhea from the surgery. Um, but how do I realize that this is a functional issue, not a food issue? So how to work on the fear of eating now that the physical issue has been worked out? Yeah, depending on the length of the bowel that was removed, um, you know, if, if it was a long section, you know, there may be a period of adaptation uh, that the bowel needs to go through so that the remaining bowel can um, adapt to the piece that's now missing and, and pick up the slack, so to speak, to, uh, to do the digestive process uh, that um, the missing piece uh, was doing before. And so it's going to be, uh, the key word is going to be gradual, to gradually reintroduce uh, foods that maybe you had trouble with before um, and see how they're tolerated. And if they're not tolerated, then back off wait a while, give your bowel some time to adapt. It can be a months long process. So you might wait a month or six weeks uh, and then try again um, to increase what you take in in your diet. Um, and then actually one last question that came in by email from somebody listening on the phone, um, stinky gas. And so I get asked that question fairly regularly in this um, arena. Could that be a symptom of a mind body issue? Any thoughts about that? Usually not. Um, 
we're, we're, what we're talking about with bad odors are very small amounts. You know, they, they smell like they ought to be, you know, huge amounts of compounds, but they're actually, the things that make uh, bowel gas smell badly are actually very small uh, quantities of, of uh, very potent compounds, let's put it that way. And those seem to result from um, certain bacteria that you have in your GI tract that are manufacturing these things. How do you get rid of those? Um, you can try probiotics, you can try yogurt with active cultures, um, you can try uh, reducing the amount of uh, uh, meats in your diet, uh, and sometimes that will um, uh, result in a shift. But it's, it's not something that medical science has come up with a great solution for but probably not uh, a mind-body issue. The one thing that I will sometimes give people the assignment is to try to get a, uh, a, an actual check on this. And so find a trusted person and sort of get a second opinion if possible. And I've had people who have found that, whether it's bad breath or stinky gas or body odor, that when they do check it with other people, it's not as bad as they assume that it is. And so every now and then there's a fear that this is an issue when in reality, it's less of an issue than people would imagine. Yeah, I've had some patients who were absolutely convinced they had horrible breath and I wasn't detecting it at all. And I asked them, you know, are your friends and family complaining about this? Nope. Uh, so it was just something that they were somehow perceiving and that absolutely did uh, in those cases respond to a mind-body approach. So we will end there. Thanks so much for just being here and spending the extra time telling about your experience in this area and helping answer the questions. Any last thoughts as we sign off? You know, I'm looking forward to the day when this is a routine part of healthcare practice and everybody listening tonight can help with that by teaching their physicians and their friends and family and anybody that they encounter who's got symptoms that might be mind-body can spread the word about this so that uh, people don't have to suffer for years and years uh, needlessly. So thank you for being here. This is, as we said, part of an ongoing series, Hope for Healing, that is being produced out of my office in conjunction with Curable. We will be replaying this both from our website and posting it in Curable in a couple of weeks. It has been my pleasure to talk with everybody to answer these insightful questions that people have to be part of a group of people who are smart enough and brave enough to address their symptoms in this nuanced alternative mind-body way that's so much more effective than so many of the more conventional treatments that we have out there. Um, please feel free, for those of you listening, to reach out to my office if you have further questions, want to consult with me, or want to get our uh, regular updates through our newsletter. Uh, you can go to my website, www.drstrax.com. So thank you to Curable for hosting us this evening. Thank you to everybody who's been here and listening and participating. I hope everybody has a great evening. I hope everybody continues to stay safe during quarantine and I hope to see everybody again soon. So thanks, John. Thanks for all you do. Absolutely. You too, Dave. Have a good evening. You too.